What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and today we have another awesome guest by the name of Eric Mann. He is a co-founder and CEO of the fitness app Zwift. Zwift is basically like a multiplayer online game, sort of a metaverse, sort of an RPG where you level up and instead of being traditional gaming it is all based on cycling and they do a little bit of running but it's a community although you're indoors you hop online and you can virtually bike around central park or you know swift island these different places that they create in the game and it has a pretty large community they've raised a ton of money eric was saying like you know half a billion dollars roughly in capital and it seems like they have a promising future. So Eric gets into that. He talks about time that he spent in London. Now he's in California. He grew up in New York City. You know, he said he's still listening to music. That's mostly from that 80s era where he grew up in New York City. So we talk about that a bit. And just in general, what it takes to start a business. Uh, he has some advice for entrepreneurs, you know, talks a bit about what life is like for him as a CEO. And I'm really looking forward to you all here in this conversation. So without further ado, we're going to actually hear from our sponsors at NetSuite first, and then we'll be right back to talk to Eric. The year 2000, 2008, 2022, when it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. First, you have the dot-com crash and the housing crash. Now you got the roller coaster that we're going through right now. But one thing is certain, it is a dangerous time to not know your numbers. Over 31,000 businesses don't really have that problem, though. They have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, everything that you need in one place so you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve your margins. When you're trying to prepare for uncertain times, remember, NetSuite is the answer. NetSuite is going to help you identify rising costs, automate your business processes, and ultimately just see where to save money. Over 93% of customers say they improved their visibility and control when they upgraded to NetSuite. So what are you waiting for? Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program, so it's the perfect time to get into it. All you have to do is head to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion, sign up, start to change how your business is operating. NetSuite.com slash myotherpassion. It's that easy. Now back to the show. Eric Men, welcome to My Other Passion. How are you doing today? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Um, sorry about all the the rescheduling. It's been just really hectic uh, recently. No, it makes it, it makes it more of an event, in my opinion. It's like, okay, we finally are making it happen. Um, you know, I've been chasing you around the world. Where were you? What's the tra- what has the traveling schedule been like? Well, you know, we've been locked up for the last couple of years. And um, uh, so I hadn't traveled in quite a bit. But when, you know, things were opening up again this year, I've, I've been traveling quite a bit. So, for example, um, I just moved to Santa Monica from the from London, you know, three months ago. Um, Los Angeles just, out here as well. I got the Kings hat. Yeah. It's crazy because I'm from Chicago and I never would have envisioned I'd be wearing so many LA hats. I'm still a diehard Chicago guy, but I kind of like mm-hmm. just saying, hey, I like this city and I'm going to rep for the teams here sometimes. I never thought I'd move to LA, to be honest with you, but um, here I am. Um, I'll tell you more about why I have been in LA. Uh, I saw your three months ago. I saw your yeah. what is the what is the riding app Starva? Strava. 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 Yeah, yeah. Strava. Yeah. I can switch my A and yeah. my R. So I I saw you on there. I'm like I can really track where you're at, Eric. Like I was like, oh wait, he's riding around Central Park now. He's all up and down to paying a can. <laughs> <laughs> so I I knew you were out here, but but um yeah, what's yeah. it been like? What's it been like? It's been great. Uh, you know uh, I. I love the weather here, um, you know, being in Santa Monica. So, you know, we get the, the cool breeze from the ocean. Um, it's just coincidence that my wife really wanted to be here. I thought I'd be much closer to our headquarters, which is in Long Beach. Um, and if you're a cyclist, which I am, uh, Santa Monica is like the meeting point to the canyons and the Malibu Hills. And so at least on the weekends, um, I'm able to venture out and, do some outdoor riding, something that I, I haven't done very much of since uh, 
since uh, I helped co-found uh, Zwift. So when you said you saw me in New York, New York City or Central Park, that was probably the virtual Central Park. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, you're you're right. You've really been locked in here. What about uh, what about London? Like you ever get out to the English countryside and those like rolling hills? Uh, I've only done London, maybe some. I took a ferry to Paris once. And so I kind of like we yeah. like went through Canterbury or something. But but as a real you really lived in London, which is something I hope to do yeah. at some point in my life. So can you like sell me on it or maybe dissuade? Yeah, me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm a you know diehard New Yorker yeah, raised in New York. Um, but, um, I moved to London for, for my first, uh, business, first startup. Um, and I was supposed to be there for just a, a couple of years. You know, I was, I was the person who raised his, you know, hand and said, okay, I'll go there because that's the, that's what the business needed us to do. Um, but it's been amazing. You know, I started a family there. Uh, we've had children there. Um, the city is just unbelievable. Um, the weather is, you know, sometimes questionable, but, uh, you know, I, I really do believe that London is really the, the, the center of the, of, of, of the universe. And from there, you can get to Asia and get to, you know, you, you get the rest of Europe and North America. Um, so I traveled a lot, even though I was based, based in London. But because of COVID, um, my wife and I decided to move to the countryside. Uh, to a place called the Cotswold, which is a region just like it's Gloucestershire and Oxfordshire. Yeah, um, yeah. That's where the r beautiful rolling countryside of 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 the UK is. is. And um, and the town that we live in, uh, you know, we have I think like four hundred, you know, residents in our in a little village. <laughs> and if you look out the valley, it looks like something has been untouched for hundreds of years. So. Um, it's, it's gorgeous. The cycling is great if that's what you want to do. Um, uh, but then the business, uh, you know, needed me to be in, in California closer to, to our headquarters. So that was a move three months ago. Um, and you know, it's, it, I, I'm a, I'm a bit spoiled from New York to, to London, to the Cotswolds, to, you know, Los Angeles. Um, I've been blessed with uh, the places that I, you know, needed to be for work. Um, but it's great to be in, in California. And I think we'll be here for, for some time. Yeah, it's it's great just to get out and, and see the world and just like, just spend time in each of these different places, get different perspectives. Um, yeah. I'm sure that even that has to help in some ways, uh, from a business standpoint, like, you know, we're all so connected now, but, but the truth is, I still think there's value in, you know, operating from different markets and, mm. you know, being able to understand, you know, what your consumers are like globally. But what do you, what do you find with Zwift? Um, you were in London for a while. Now you're here in California, like, you know, it's more than just packing up and moving. Obviously you have to be close to the company, but I'm sure, I'm sure a guy like you comes in and says like, wow, I'm making this big adjustment in my life. Here's what I'm hoping to accomplish. Here's where I'm at in my company. It's been almost a decade. Like where is Swift yeah. now? Where are you now? All, all of it is happening. I see you had like the, um, the Zwift hub, like trainer come yeah. out, smart yeah. trainer. Yeah. Like there's these developments with the company. There's these developments in your personal life. Like yeah. let us know what that is right now. Yeah. So um, uh, for your listeners who might not never heard of Zwift. Um, so we've, uh, let me just start with that. I, we're um, like a video game almost for fitness and What's unique about this video game is that people do physical, like fitness activities in this video game together. So it's an MMO. Um, for the most part, uh, most most people are just riding their bike you know, virtually. So they have their bicycle and they've got a, something called a smart trainer that connects to your bike and gives that immersive experience. So for example, if you go up a hill in the game, it will add resistance and it's very natural and feels it feels really good. Um, so we also have running, but cycling is really the core of the experience. Um, and cycling is such a universal activity. So when you talk about like, you know, who are our customers, we are everywhere. We have cu customers in over, like, you know, over 180 different countries. 
Um, I just got back from our other operation we have in Rio de Janeiro, which is another another beautiful place. Um, we have an office. So we have an office um, in Long Beach, in in London, and and Rio de Janeiro. Um, and our customers are just really, really go- global. Um, and the reason why, um, you know, I travel frequently back to the UK and Europe is that's the heartland of like cycling. That's where the Tour de France happens, right? Mm-hmm. And it's really, you know, cycling is a big part of everyone's culture in, in, in Europe. So I'd say more than half of our business is in Europe. Although we're a California-based company, I mean, the the the, the idea of Zwift was born about nine years ago. It was conceived out of London, where I was based, but we chose to set up shop in in, in Long Beach. One of my co-founders, John Mayfield, is based in um, in Southern California, in, in Los Angeles as well, or Irvine or Orange County. Um, and so we decided to set up shop there, thinking it might be easier for us to to recruit game developers. Um, but little did I know that the business would quickly take us to, to Europe. So I stayed in Europe uh, or, or London for, for many years. Um, and it's only like, you know, I'm going, we're going on almost our ninth year or the beginning of our ninth year. And I'm finally, you know, made the transition to come here because um, it is incredibly challenging to run a business that is eight hours away. You know, where you've got, you know, especially during COVID, we've hired people from all over the place, but and working from home and working remotely over Zoom, the eight-hour difference has been killing me. So uh, there has been a real effort to bring as much of the executive team together in this, at least at the very least, in the same time zone, so we can just you know coordinate and communicate. Um, so that's been the real uh, uh, reason for me to to come out here. And you know, California is is a, is a great place to be. I do have a dog. <laughs> in the UK that I miss very much. I left him behind. Uh, but I that gives me reason to go back to the Cotswolds because I need to see my dog. <laughs> yeah, I hope I hope the dog is doing well. Um yeah, it sounds it sounds like an interesting journey. Um, you know, just when like thinking about across these time zones. Yeah. I've been down I've been to Rio uh some years back. You awesome know, place. Um really cool. Um, yeah, I want to get into like a whole Brazilian conversation, but, um, cause I was in Sao Paulo as well, but there's this mm-hmm. little town in between them called like part of Chi or something. I, I believe mm-hmm. that it's like P-A-R-A-T-I, but like a little accent. And, um, I don't know, check it out. If you like be, if you're like down there in Brazil, it's like this little colonial town. It's nice. beautiful and it's like secluded and, um, yeah, that's my that's my tidbit that I have to offer. Mm -hmm. But when I hear you talk about like going on the beginning of the ninth year, cause I think I did hear you say the idea was born in like November, 2013 or something. So, you know, coming up on a decade, um, what have you, what have you learned? Like this is FOS as a publication and just a lot of our listeners, it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, people who are really into the process, if not like running their own businesses. And um, mm. I think it's always valuable to like share information and, and, you know, learnings and just what do you, what do you have to say yeah. about trying to like build something and, and make it successful? Well, um, I started my career on, on Wall Street. Um, I worked at JP Morgan uh, Investment Bank back then. Um, and uh, after a number of years at JP Morgan, my partner and I, who is still a partner of mine, Alaric, uh, um, a good friend, uh, we decided to leave JP Morgan and start our own company, building a financial trading system over the internet. Back then, you know, cloud was, they, they didn't even coin the term cloud services back then, but the idea for us was to, to bring this, these services to the, to the internet. So we started that business called Sakana Technology uh, many, many years ago. So that was a, a real lesson in like, how do we build something from nothing? And, you know, we, we, we had a great experience. Um, that business took me to, to London actually, um, where we got set up. Uh, again, it's one of those things we started the business in New York city thinking, okay, the new, you know, the U S is a big market. And then Europe really was where our core business was. So then I moved to, to London and, um, set up shop there. Um, but that's when I first learned, you know, what it takes to, to, 
conceive an idea to sell, you know, come up with a plan, sell it to investors to raise the capital, to then convince people to join you on this like long journey to build a business <laughs> that may or may not happen, right? And then convince customers to pay you uh, and then to turn this into a sustainable business. Uh, we had no clue what we were doing, but somehow, you know, and there's always luck involved. Don't, you know, don't let anyone tell you there's no luck involved. There's always luck involved. <laughs> um, and we managed to turn our business or our startup into something that I'd say by most standards, a successful startup. Um, but what I learned after that was because I'd been on my own for so long. I was my own boss. In fact, I had investors, of course. Um, and, and, you know, we were accountable to our staff as well, but the idea of going back to, you know, wall street or somewhere else to work for someone else was just so foreign to me that I had to think about like starting another business. Um, and it was really in the absence of, you know, any better idea. Um, the idea was born to try to create a business around getting people to be, you know, uh, uh, coming together in a, in, a, in a virtual environment, which is a very efficient way to bring people together, right? Um, and to, uh, to create a common goal of, like, let's motivate one another to, to, stay, uh, to stay fit. And let's do this through um, a video game experience uh, with some equipment that you need. Most people have a bicycle. Um, and then let's create all these experiences that people enjoy outdoors, Let's just try to do that virtually um, because I'm a longtime cyclist. Um, and what I missed about cycling uh, in London was the community that I had in, in New York. It, it took me a while to understand what I was actually missing, what motivated me to exercise. And more than just staying fit, it was a sense of, you know, being part of a community, competing, training, doing things. Uh, together with other people was was highly motivating for me. So that is exactly what I wanted to recreate in a virtual setting. Um, others have tried to do this before, uh, but with a solo experience. They were just trying to simulate what you were doing outdoors as a single player experience. What we decided to do was from the very beginning say, what's most important about this is that you do it with other people. So everything that we did was like, anchored around social and social density. And, you know, we, we had the opportunity to create huge maps, but we chose like small maps. And so that more people could see one another. And as a community group, we would grow the map. We would then offer multiple maps. And we, we curated this very carefully so that whenever you go on to Zwift, you never feel like you're having a solo experience. You're always there with other people. So, um, yeah, so it's been a journey. It's, it's my third job. I, I think about this, like, you know, I'm not that young. And this has really been my, my third job. So I don't have much of a CV. Um, but it's been, uh, it's been a, a real ride for, for me, for sure. Yeah, so the, the value of community seems to be like yeah. at the forefront of that. Yeah, and also you mentioned you know, selling the company um, in the sense of like selling the idea, you know, convincing yeah. not only that community, but investors that, you know, it's, it's a viable product and it, it is going yeah. to become what you're like dreaming and envisioning that it will. And you all have raised a good amount of money. I want like 620 million or something like that. Yeah. Out it's about a half a billion dollars for, for this business. It seems crazy to raise that much money, but we did. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, how do you, how do you think you pulled it off? I mean, you, you well, well yeah. I can tell, I look, I can tell that you're, you know, you're, you're an accomplished guy. Like you just, it seems like you would come to the table and, and, and be able to, convince us all that this is a great idea but yeah just how do you think how do you think you really made that happen um you know looking from a first person standpoint yeah I, I think a lot of that is just being authentic you know i was being really authentic about the kind of business that we could build um i think i had the credibility because i was you know i am a cyclist you know and, and i think people uh know that it did help that my previous uh, venture was successful so I actually pitched the idea to 200 of my friends, 200 of my friends and 
friends of friends, their associates, a hundred of them invested. So we had a, I had a 50% hit ratio of, you know, the pe people we pitched to, and we raised $7 million in the friends and family round. So that was a huge boost. I think, um, I think people, uh, I think most people who invested back then, these are my friends and family, they, they really did believe in what we, we, you know, we're trying to build this, this virtual setting. And, you know, look, 10 years before that, I think people would have said, this is crazy. But by then, like Facebook had been around already. Social media had been around. Video games was becoming more popular. Everyone um, was connected to one another um, virtually, effectively, right? Not just through th video games, but through other means. So it wasn't s such a big leap of, of faith that you could create this, you know, uh, virtual experience through through a video game. Um, but it was still, you know, it's still risky, right? You, know, you don't really know if it's going to work. So my job, my I think the most important job that I have as a as a co-founder and as a CEO of this business is to articulate the business to to you know authentically sell the business you know to not only the investors but the people that we needed to help build the business um so i think uh i could only have done that with businesses that i i could be passionate about you know and this one i was really passionate in fact because i was so passionate about this i was concerned about starting this business you know when right you, like you if, you had, if you had if you had <laughs> yeah, if you almost had like this like confirmation bias or if you were trying to make yeah. it something just because you love cycling but it actually wasn't a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it happens, seems I like a lot. Yeah. I bet cuz everyone thinks that the thing that they're so in love with is going to translate to a broader audience and it's just that's, that's just right. not always the case. Plus you have to have an actual good product. You have to have the execution. Yeah. You know, you very well may have had um you know, a lot of great perspective as a cyclist and even even a good idea to merge it with video games or something. But what I've seen a lot of conversation about is like we have like people have feedback. Like they want to see this, they want to see that. I've heard people say, you know, oh, this it was buggy or I want the graphics to be better or what have you. But I'd say almost overwhelmingly, man, like your community is pretty positive. And I'm I would be ready to get in here and say, Oh, this, Oh, that, like, let me try to, but, but they're all like, yeah, it's, it's definitely the best. It's the best experience. Um, so, you know, you had to deliver on that, but I'm sure, I'm sure a CEO, it's almost crazy. Sometimes when you run a company, I know it's important to like build a culture where you foster the success and, you know, everyone feels good about it, but it, sometimes it feels like, damn, you're, you're always like looking for mistakes or you're always looking for like inefficiencies. How can we improve? And like, how do you, at this point, you, you got this great fans and family around, you've raised all this money from all these investors. Um, and there's a lot to be happy about, but how do you like stay critical and like stop, you know, really listen to negative feedback and just like allow yourself to grow in that manner? Well, we, we listen to all that feedback. Um, you know, uh, constantly looking at social media feedback, both good and bad, mostly bad, right? <laughs> um, uh, and, and, you know, these are critical comments and we factor that into how we prioritize, uh, you know, what we do. And it's always a challenge between things that we can do better versus things that, that are new, new, right? And trying to also like balancing things that are important to our, you know, hardcore customers who've been around for a long time versus like those new customers who are coming in troves and, and, and they have slightly different requirements. It's really, really tough to manage all that. But, um, you know, I, I feel pretty good about the new product roadmap that we've, we've laid out and we're much more communicative these days about what we're building. And so that's, um, I think, I think the community has really appreciated that. We've not always been so, so clear about what we're building um but yeah just uh it, it's it's the community has been something that i really it, it just didn't really click in until the community started to really feel a sense of ownership of what we were also building um that was not the case with my previous uh business um it wasn't even really a factor in in, in the business plan that we put together um, but that's been really interesting. I, I've, I've learned a lot about what community actually means, what church means and, and how people 
uh, govern themselves. Um, and, you know, on our platform, just like any other, just like society, you, you got bad players that we have to deal with also. Um, we have competition and there's fairness. And like, it's like we have to govern this community and we have to have tools and people to help manage it. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been really fascinating for, for me personally. Yeah, like I, I, from the outside looking in, I wouldn't have guessed the amount of like emotion that is wrapped up in Zwift. And like, like you said, the competition. And I know there was like some type of community issue where you did have some, some bad players and it was, you know, like this weight doping situation. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't have even guessed when I, when I saw that, that like these type of things could happen as if I'm thinking, Oh, it's just like video game experience, et cetera. But like people, it's, it's a real competitive, like, Oh yeah. Like aspect to it. Like, what does it mean? What do you get more than bragging rights or like, you know, is it, cause it, when you see something like that, I'm like, is this a real sport? Like, this is like a certified, these are the type of things you hear about, um, <laughs> And, and I guess, you know what, when people play like Call of Duty and stuff, it's also yeah. important that there's fairness, but I just didn't, you're so used to like these solo things. I hopped on a treadmill and it's just, so, and yeah, I can make it like a little mountain run or whatever, but I'm just not thinking about the fact that, okay, other people are involved and this has to be fair. And it's like, that's yeah. something that Zwift has to contend with. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, we help co-create a new discipline within cycling um, called cycling esports, and this is a, a a an official discipline by that's uh, you know governed by UCI, which is the, the governing body for cycling. So Did not know that. we've had two world championships already, and the third world championships we're we're hosting as well in February. So um, you know I, I've been saying this for probably almost seven or eight years now, but I do believe that this kind of activity will make its way into the Olympics. I hope, fingers crossed, for the 2028 uh, LA Olympics, where, you know, people will be competing on stationary bikes, but in this virtual world. Um, so that happens. I mean, we, we hosted the virtual Tour de France two years ago because the Tour de France couldn't happen because of COVID. Yeah. So we had the same, you know, teams and same organization. We hosted a... Uh, a multi-stage event uh, during the month of July, which was uh, which was really really you know exciting for for a brand like Zwift. Yeah, it's I, I've definitely learned uh, since just kind of preparing to have this convo with you, like how serious it is. Um, you know, you think of like gamification, and it and it still feels like kind of novel. I think to like the mainstream to a lot of people, and I'm like, wow, no, this is. This is serious. Um, is... Yeah, I'll, ahead, I'll tell no. you one thing. They, we, we have something called Zwift Academy. We just um, we're in the process of uh, finishing Zwift Academy. Zwift Academy. I don't know if you you uh, follow. Um, I did see Grand Zwift Tur Academy. Yeah, so Gran Turismo has. Um, I'm a right, gamer, um, bro. Like I'm. Yeah, I'm a. Right. I I remember when the first one came out, and I was like, "This is photorealistic." Although I will yeah. say. I'm a Forza guy now. I'm like more of an Xbox yeah, guy. Yeah, Forza is pretty awesome. Forza is beautiful, yeah. but but you've okay. heard of uh, GT Academy, right? GT yes. Academy, yeah. where they take gamers and find a driver and then put them through training, and then they go on to become a real racing driver, right? Yep. And some of them have gone on to become like they've gone on to win Le Mans, like I think it was age category, but they they still became real drivers. Of course, we took that concept eight years ago. And we said, we're going to create something called Zwift Academy. Same concept. And we're going to use Zwift as a talent identification, you know, uh, platform. And then and let a lot of people just take part, participate to get fitness. But there will be two lucky winners, right? Um, men and women. And if they go on to win, they become professional cyclists in the real world. We've been doing that now for five years. This year, the, the, the person who won two years ago um, uh, won two stages of Tour of Spain, which is like, it's like one tier, it's two tier, one tier down from the Tour de France. And so, um, and he's become a hugely famous, successful professional cyclist, and he's got more to give going forward. But that, the idea that Zwift could be a platform to identify talent you otherwise wouldn't find and then give them the opportunity to become a professional cyclist. 
that is what people get super excited. That's what I get excited about. Um, and so we're going through that now. We're going through a process of vetting all these incredible athletes, and two of them will get professional contracts. Uh, you know, before I think it's before uh, Thanksgiving or, or early December. Man, that's major. Is it is it true that you? Uh require i guess uh your investors to be zwifters like to what extent <laughs> so to what i what extent yeah. can you really ensure that well i i'd say um I've, I've yet to take on investors who are not passionate about at least fitness you know you right. kind of have to buy into what we're selling which is like hey let's get everyone uh motivate everyone to to to, to stay fit and lead healthy happy lives that's the mission of our business and if we can fulfill that it will turn into a great business that was and by the way my partner alaric from my last business he's not a cyclist and he's not super fit and he was he was the first person who said you know getting more people to be more active more often which is our our, our motto is something that a lot of people can get behind investors and partners and customers and sponsors so um, you know, that still holds true today. And so, yeah, of course, I, I want investors who buy into that ethos. And, and, um, and so far, yeah, every one of them, that they are, I mean, most of them, if not all of them, are active uh, Zwifters, you know, as, as they say. Can you tell us a little about people across other disciplines who use Zwift? Because I've seen yeah. you mention that F1 drivers and footballers and NHL players mm -hmm. use Zwift. And like, who are some of those people? What type of impact are you seeing from, you know, the best athletes in the world who decide to jump on your platform? Um, so, yeah, we have uh, lots of athletes. Uh, I, I met a cricketer uh, just a few weeks ago who was out here. It turns out a lot of, a lot of professional athletes uh, enjoy cycling. And Formula One is, is definitely one of those uh, sports. I think MotoGP uh, athletes as well. Um, and they tend to bring their bikes to the track. So that's how they inspect the track is on their bike. And they also find, you know, riding outdoors and indoors, um, something that helps them prepare endurance, especially indoor riding. It helps them with like the heat, getting used to, you know, uh, um, all the cardiovascular work and, and uh, you know, and the, the heat acclimation that you need in, in a car. Um, baseball players, hockey players, you name it. It's, you get the full gamut. It turns out a lot of people just enjoy cycling, right? And if you enjoy cycling, Zwift is just another way to do more of this, more of that. Um, we tend to cater to, to people who just don't have the time to go out. Like that includes me. I live in Southern California, but I don't have the time to go out during the week. So during the week, I ride indoors. And on the weekends, when I have more time, I go outdoors. And because mm -hmm. I ride indoors and that's super efficient, I stay super fit. When I go outdoors, I just have a much better, you know, social experience with, with, with right. my friends. You're not, you're not feeling like, oh, I have to catch up. You're like, I've been doing this. Now I just get to go on the yeah. Pacific Coast and, and enjoy. Yeah. I mean, look, if you're a fitness person, what if I told you you could get the same fitness for half the amount of time? Would you do it? Or would you like to just spend more time getting to the same fitness that's, level? <laughs> that's half of my, the, my issue is having to drive to the gym now. I mean – when I lived in Manhattan, I don't know. I mean, I was right. I was on York Avenue right by Asphalt yeah. Green. I would walk like a block. And it was, yeah. I was the most into my fitness I've ever been. Yeah. Um, now it's cool, but I still have to drive like two miles and it's different. Yeah. yeah. I, I tell you that friction that you're talking about is so important. Like, because, you know, um, that's what we talk about at Swift. Like, how do we make it super convenient so that you can't say no? <laughs> right. And that, and for cycling, it means doing it at home because that is the easiest thing you can do. Uh, going outdoors, getting ready for going outdoors, getting a flat tire, all these things. I just don't have time for that stuff during the week. <laughs> right. um, any, any of those encounters that like, are just memorable to you? Like, like anything that's just particularly cool in your history of, 
of Zwift that you're like, wow, like this iconic person or this, this just situation, obviously the community of just everyday people is really important, but you know, look, we love, we love stories about awesome yeah. things that happen in a boardroom or, you know, at these like cool events and just across business, you have investors you're looking for so many people yeah. like in this world, like mm -hmm. look at look at whenever there's a round for some company it's always like all these big names and i just wonder like what have you done that maybe you walked away from me or like wow that was that was a cool experience yeah i mean in terms of celebrities in terms of sporting athletes i mean we have a lot of interesting people on zwift from you know your average person off the street to like you know the billionaires because they all are passionate about cycling um uh, I just I found out just recently Daniel Ek, who is the founder of uh, of Spotify, um, he and other tech moguls get on a call on Zoom on Zwift, and they have like that's you know they they do that together, <laughs> which is which that's is pretty fire. cool. Zuckerberg is known to be on on Zwift. In fact, if you saw the the, the latest Meta ad, that's everywhere on the internet. They show like this 3D video game of cycling. That is Zwift, by the way. They I, um, I so heard about that. Yeah. I heard about that because it, it was it was sort of like wow. Even with the company that's trying to push the metaverse, they're kind of yeah. like using another metaverse <laughs> to yeah. to communicate that. So props to you all. Yeah, I think that says a lot about uh, Zwift as a reference for what the metaverse is. I mean. We, we were we were this for many many years already we just didn't call it the metaverse but like this idea that there's this virtual place that everyone kind of checks in one hour a day and then they get kind of get lost in this world for one hour and then they check out and go back to their real world i think that is how we're going to operate going forward for better or for worse i don't know but the idea that you're going to take slice of your time every day and go this place to work and this place for fitness and this place for gaming and this place for, you know, something else. Um, and you're going to do that all from the comfort of your, of your home. I think that is, uh, that in my mind is going to be the future of how we spend our time, you know, between the real world and, and what people are calling the metaverse now. What do you think about peloton like you're not a publicly traded company but yeah it's it's kind of surreal sometimes when i look at that stock um it's yeah. like really ugly and 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 that's sort of a lot of people's association or reference point for like a company like zwift and i understand fundamentally it's different in a lot of ways but like how do you yeah. avoid that type of you know story arc yeah, it's a it's a good question. So you know, uh, people compared us to Peloton when the Peloton stock was at you know um, all time high, where they were worth fifty billion dollars to you know to what it is now. And and I think Peloton as a business, it's a it's a good product. I think I think the business is just it just got too big too fast, and it over invested. Um, I think I know Barry McCarthy, uh, the, the CEO, and he's going to fix the business. Um, whether or not they can continue to scale the business going forward is a different challenge. But the first order of business for him is to make sure that they don't run out of capital. And I think he, they've hired the right person to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, but, um, you know, Peloton as a as a service, as a product is, is, is good. I mean, they took spinning and really scaled it into into this massive business it's just the the cost structure around the business needs to be fixed and that's just really hard um and it's hurting their brand clearly uh but i th i don't see peloton disappearing anytime soon i think i think they'll come out of this um, but we are different you know the only where we're similar is that you you're indoors on a, a stationary bike that's that's where the common ground, you know, starts and ends. And then the experience is just totally different. Um, you know, we're all about a 3D experience. We're all about doing stuff together in real time. And we allow, unlike Peloton, uh, our community to create content. Like Peloton would never allow their community to create their own 
content on, on their platform. So we're more, if they're Apple, we're, we're, you know, Android, you know, or Google. So, um, and I think we need to, if you want the power of the community to help drive and grow the business, you have to empower the community and give them more tools to, to, you know, help them, you know, create what they feel like is, is, you know, something that they own. Um, and that I think is the future of how we scale our business. How do you think the more like traditional, perhaps uh, gaming companies are are handling not only community but just even like the hardware rollout over the past couple years like you know we're up to ps5 xbox yeah. series x the switch is still going super strong um super outselling everything like in general which is funny because you know nintendo's just they always got to trick up their sleeves and then even like the pc market i mean look gaming is such a big part of zwift despite all of the fitness aspects and what do you what do you think of the business now like i'm i'm a gamer i had a sega genesis when i was a kid you know up until now um what do you think of like that whole industry well i tell you you know our customers are are for the most part not hardcore gamers Mm -hmm. most of our customers i would say more than 60 percent of our customers are apple customers they right. run Zwift on like an iPad or an Apple TV or their MacBooks. Um, so clearly not, you know, the PC gamers. Uh, we well, don't I almost wonder consoles. you personally. Well, I, I know. I just wonder you personally, like, because I, I can imagine like the average Zwift user is not yeah. like on Call of Duty all night. I just mean you are somewhat tangentially like related to gaming. So you still probably have some awareness of like what Microsoft and Sony and all of them are doing. Just what do you make of the space now? You got Game Pass, you yeah. got this, you got that. Games are $70. They make this much. Grand Theft Auto 6 leaked the other week. Like, yeah. I just wonder as like, do you care about that type of gaming? And do you just like, as a fan, mean, have any perspective? You mean the the, the different business models? Of, yeah, exactly. Because uh, like as a as a nerd on it, sometimes I just look. I'm like, look, look what Phil Spencer and Satya Nadella are doing over at Microsoft, and like how they're really pushing for a subscription business, yeah. even more than like the hardware and just some of those things from like a CEO's perspective. When you look at yeah. like the other companies, I had Peter Moore on here who was uh, he ran Xbox and EA Sports, and it was like awesome to hear him talk about that. I'm like, I'm like, you you yeah. must have an opinion at least. Yeah, well, look, um, you're seeing more and more uh, companies move to the subscription model because Wall Street has really rewarded those those companies. I think they're gonna. It's going to get increasingly harder. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, for consumers a lot of subscription fatigue, and so you're seeing that in the streaming business already. You know, and customers are going to pick one or two st- streaming you know services. Like you don't need like five. In fact, when the recession scare was happening like i went through like which you know subscription services do i not need and i started turning stuff off same right? like everyone Bro. else right yeah march <laughs> about, about march 15th i was yeah. like oh my god <laughs> like half <laughs> of this has to go yeah exactly so there's, there's a bit of fatigue so it, it's not all subscription businesses will do well and i think um, most consumers will pick one. Like, you, do you need multiple music streaming services? No, you pick one. Like, I, I pick Spotify, right? Yeah, or well, for, you got to Daniel out. Daniel Eck put it together. I'm, I'm a big Spotify person. I love their UX way yeah. more than Apple. I have to just be real. Like, it yeah. just feels good in my hands. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of, of Spotify. And, you know, for videos, um, I think Netflix is what I have all the time. And then depending on where the hits are, I might just turn on you know, the different services just to watch the hit, but then mm-hmm. I won't commit to the only one that I commit, I've committed to, and I've never really unsubscribed for a long, long time is, is, uh, is Netflix. So, uh, people are going to be more selective. Yeah. For the gaming industry, I, you know, I, I, I think trying to figure out the balance between subscription, the free to play, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert in this, for the, in the gaming industry, but I think the idea of just selling a one-time hit is is probably going to go away. You know, I, I, I do see people, I think it's better for, for businesses to have a steady stream, reliable stream of of, of um, revenues from, from, a, from a customer. So this yeah, is what we're still trying to That's why they can do free-to-play. That's why they can do free-to-play now. Like, 
Fortnite is free. And they you, all their numbers came out with the Apple lawsuit. And I was like, this is insane. They make tens and tens and hundreds of billions tens. of dollars just from people buying like skins, costumes, <laughs> skins. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. But when you have that many customers, um, you can, you can do that. Um, I think so. If, if you don't have hundreds of millions of customers, then probably a subscription business is, is the better way to go. And that's what and we've even, chosen. Yeah. I was just saying, even within that, they'll be like, Hey, get the season pass. Like, you know, there's some way to tie you in all the time. I think there's a real opportunity, uh, even for a business like ours or even like Peloton to, you can have your base subscription and then you can sell exclusive content on top of that. You don't have to buy it, but, you know, you're, you're going to buy it because it's not made by us. It's made by someone else. And they're just using our platform to deliver it. So I can see that kind of uh, business model for even Zwift going forward. Um, I think that there's a huge opportunity for, for us and to take all the things that you can buy in the real world and, and, and offer digital versions. Um, uh, it seems so, like it, it seems like we're on our way in a lot of ways. So all of this, learning all of this about you over the course of this conversation, uh, which has been great, by the way, really, really am glad that we were finally able to make it happen. Yeah. But um, one thing that's interesting to me, so like, you know, like you said, New Yorker, I know you were there since you were super young, um, yeah. you know, so I'm so I can imagine a lot of who you are was formed uh, in your times in that city, but you go to London, that's a huge part of your life. Now you're in California. Um, but I guess starting with, we talked about London and California just inherently because of how it's related to your work. What about the New York part though? Like you're, you're in New York city in like the eighties, like growing up, you know, this yeah. is, uh, this is stuff that people look back now and it's like golden era. It's iconic. Now, I'm sure it was a different reality. That's the that's the fact of nostalgia. We always forget like some of the harsh realities. But just like how did that make you? And what type of like, you know, all this incredible music's coming out, right? Hip hop is a brand new genre. You know, punk has already made its mark. And just like, you know, whether it's like the new order and all the stuff happening with Depeche Mode and just between yeah. music, the film, you know, you got like John Hughes, you got Spielberg starting to take hold, like from a cultural standpoint, um, I, I imagine that life is more than Zwift and cycling to you or, or, or maybe not. Maybe those are it's like Zwift family cycling. That's it. Or, or are you someone who has a lot of pop culture references, has a lot of that stuff that's like super important to you and super important to yeah. your time in New York and London, these world class cities, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I still listen to almost exclusively to like 80s music. <laughs> that was such an important part of my life. Um, and uh, New York was very different back then. And when I go to New York these days, it feels like a foreign place. It's changed so much, right? Neighborhoods have changed. People have, it's gentrified. People have moved out. Like the cool people live in Brooklyn now. They don't live in, <laughs> they don't live in Manhattan anymore. Um but New York uh, will always be a, a real special place. The, the city that never sleeps is it, that can't be any truer than, than New York City, right? Um, I used to live on the Upper West Side, um, and um, uh, and you know between work, play, um, all the hobbies, the access to Central Park, you never really needed to leave the island. It's amazing. And, you know, it's a, it's a city of what, I think, uh, 4 million people. And then I think another 4 million people commute into it. So, like, it has so much life, you know, 24-7. I would love I that. I love that. I would always love that feeling. And it would make me feel like I had found, like, home and community. Because I, I grew up in the Chicago area, but was, like, the Midwest kid who, like, couldn't wait to get to the coast. And, and I ran out there. And it, it was did a lot of important and special things for my life as it tends to do for people, that city. Um, but you ever just, you're going to get groceries or something and you're like, I have been on an Island, a literal Island for like 
seven weeks you know you haven't gone to visit any friends yeah. in, in yeah. brooklyn or anything and you're just like i just been on this island like you're like yeah. because the thing for me is like when you scale out i think if you were on like a castaway type island you're always going to be so conscious of it and new york is this insane world but then i'm like you know it really is just a bigger island in fact that whole area even long island it's just geographically sometimes i'll have like these surreal moments um yeah. and and new york pro produces that i i think there are people in chinatown of manhattan who may have never left the island for like decades they have wow. no reason to leave you know <laughs> so um but yeah manhattan is 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 well and will continue to be a special place um and i'm i'm gonna go i still have family in new york so i do i do uh visit quite often um yeah I'm, but yeah i'm headed, it's, I'm headed it's there this place. week I'm headed oh, there this awesome. week, got family as well. Um, yeah, I'm always open. I'm like, yeah, I'm in LA for now. Maybe I move back. Maybe I go to London like you. But what is, before we get out of here, you can't just throw uh, that I exclusively listen to 80s music and that it was an important part of my life at me, especially I'm like a music, like obsessive in a lot of ways. And, you know, 80s, I still, I was born in the late 80s. Um, and I rep for my generation heavy, but I learned so much from going back to whether it was like the Pixies or it was like Run DMC or Madonna or just like anything, whether it was new it's wave, boys. pop, rap, BCs. <laughs> so like, so like what type of, what, what type of stuff like yeah. really like moved you and defined you and why was it so important? Yeah. Well, there, uh, it was mostly rock. Um, but I, I, I well, rock. Tell us, tell us the bands. I mean, you know, back then it was U two, the small band called the Stand. Um, I listened to uh, OMD, Depeche Mode, of course. Um, I listened to, um, geez, uh, uh, you know, All classic eighties. De Depeche, yeah, Depeche you know. Mode. Yeah, of course, Depeche Mode alone, like just violator music for the masses, like all yeah. incredible records. So yeah, but, you uh, were going to get into we, something else. Yeah. But I... yeah. So I was going to tell you that, you know, you, you mentioned that we just launched a, a piece of hardware called the hub. It's yeah. this direct drive trainer that uh, attaches to the bike and the commercial just got released today. It's our advertising, you know, new brand spot, 30 second brand Song. spot. And the inspiration behind that was a music video from the 80s called um take on me from aha do you know that so the rotoscoping you, with the with the yeah animated yeah, to real life yeah. yeah yeah so like that is a piece of 80 music that was the inspiration behind this commercial so take a look at that so it goes back to yeah 80s music is pretty pretty important to me <laughs> No, that's super real. And, you know, there's like this filter on TikTok where you can do that now. And I was sitting there like, wow, you probably watched that video in real time in 85. And it was like, yeah. every time I read about people, they're like, that was so mind blowing. The technology, we couldn't believe it. And to think now it's just like, yeah, let me just press a filter. Anybody can do this on their phone, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, take a it's look crazy, at the well, I Check saw it. it. So, like so that. well, the ad, the ad was like an awesome update of it. And really like, you know, I thought, I thought just did a good job of communicating what, you know, Zwift is all about. So it's did always cool the, to the see those inspirations. Like going exactly. I did. I did. And, yeah. and like yeah. those, the, to think that like these little different experiences help mold the creative for something like that. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. 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 No, it's great. So, word. Well, I am excited to see where you take things. I love, I love really getting behind the scenes and understanding how you think you've really built something special. And I appreciate you just like opening up to us and yeah, and letting us know like what it really takes to, to make something like this and and what your vision really is. You know, I um, I, I just on on that note, I you know I do get a lot of um, um, requests from entrepreneurs about, you know, their business ideas. And one thing I do tell them is like, look, it's going to take a lot longer than you think. It's going to take a lot more money than you think to turn something into a real business. And most businesses take 10 years to really build. 
Like, are you ready for that? Like, it's not a big, it's not an easy, it should be an easy decision because it's a long, hard road and most fail. Um, so, um, yeah, it, but I love it when I see entrepreneurs just, you know, go all in and try to make something, you know, happen. All right. You feel like it's, it's, it's paying off for Zwift. You're almost 10 years in, so you're, you've seen yeah. the full arc. <laughs> well, I don't think we've seen the full arc yet, but we definitely have product market fit and, um, we have a lot of work, uh, to do. And with or without me, I think this business will continue to, to, to carry on for years to come because I think this kind of experience isn't going anywhere. I think you're just going to see more of this kind of experience across this different disciplines. All right. Well, we'll keep our eyes peeled for that. Thank you so much for your time, Eric. Yeah. Thank you for having me. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. I want to thank Eric for coming out and taking the time to tell us all about Zwift, you know, taking the time to tell us all about his journey, his background. I think it's really cool when people take a risk and, you know, something that was an idea, you know, pretty much a decade ago is now one of the leading properties and apps across fitness. And, you know, you have millions of people who've signed up for it. It was really cool to hear about how it got to that point. So we're going to keep this going, as always, back next Wednesday. It's been a ton of fun so far. Please hit me up if you have any feedback. Go drop something in the Apple reviews or the Spotify reviews. Go listen to some of the other podcasts that we're doing for FOS. We just launched one called The Newsroom that is a lot of fun. Uh, one of our writers on Point Dexter hops on with other writers to, to talk about current events and you know really go in deep on some of our best reporting so make sure you check that out and make sure you keep it locked on my other passion too i know front office sports is starting to fill up your your podcast queue but you know what can i say we have a lot to talk about so appreciate you listening and uh we'll be back soon i'm out <laughs>